center even throughout our state we are eagerly waiting for us because sir is president sir is our civil engineering fraternity that is proudly i say that all the members our president is with us our president is our fraternity so whenever our demand anything will be there our president sir fulfill the entire things so that type of very kindness will be there and also is a dynamic and young and dynamic person so instead of his busy schedule in spite of his busy schedule he agreed to come and give a presidential address that to our kanjipuram local center really it's a lucky center for giving our president sir in valuable address so next i thank our chairman dr nagaraj sir yesterday night he spoke to from us he is out of country so he gave best wishes to our program and also he in a interact this particular one uh, next i thank our cat chairman dr ranganath so he is also express his inability to joining this one he is having some important work but he gave the uh, 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 wishes and other things and also i thank all the participants especially the panelists dr haji sir dr lima rose ma'am Uh, for uh, giving this uh, valuable uh, address and valuable topic that is uh, very uh, uh, interesting and also very vi vibrant uh, one so it's a very uh, wonderful uh, webinar uh, i apologies for all the participants including our honorable president sir because the president sir uh, waited for uh, more than 10 minutes uh, because a small uh, communication gap and also the link problem will be there so uh, kindly apologies uh, myself um, so now this uh, thing uh, send over to our uh, session will be handed over to our uh, uh, host uh, maybe our uh, honorable president may become our uh, presidential address thank you sir thank you thank you dr ilamuli thank you sir very good morning to all eminent panelist of today's session uh, dr a lima rose associate professor srm villamala engineering college dr ms haji ali sheikh mohammed professor and dean academic affairs bs abdul rahman crescent institute of science and technology dr d ilango chairman kachipuram local center dr g shamun sundaram honorary secretary kachipuram local center moderator mr y abrahim my council and uh, civil engineering division board colleagues committee members of kachipur local center dear participants student friends i consider it a great opportunity for all of us to be a part of this webinar on a very contemporary topic application of sustainable concrete in modern constructions being organized today by iai kachipur local center the institution of engineers india the largest multidisciplinary body of engineers has always been in the forefront providing valuable inputs to the government for making policy decisions especially on the issues related to social development disaster mitigation and addressing to the global crisis through engineering solutions the effort of the institution has always been to keep its member informed and updated about the latest engineering and technological developments occurring in national and international arena through organizing technical events on emerging topics at present there are two existential challenges being faced by our world first one is the climate change and second one is the crisis in natural world impacting its biodiversity lots of seminars conferences and discussions have taken place on climate change and global warming and its effect on the world environment various discussions have taken place on the carbon emission due to use of fossil fuel and industrialization and its effect on environment but hardly the impact of concrete on the environment has been discussed on this platform so i congratulate kachipuram local center for selecting this topic for today's webinar sustainable concrete construction is a step towards green and eco friendly concrete construction practices to solve global environmental problems concrete is a construction material which has been used substantially all over the world regarding the amount of concrete that has produced use and its impact are considered as an important part of the whole global environmental problems the effect of concrete is taking place in different stages from the extraction of the raw material until the end of structural life life cycle assessment is employed for better understanding and assessing the environmental impacts of concrete 
it is necessary to take all the life stages of concrete that is manufacturing, construction, life and demolition in order to assess the environmental impacts. Global warming due to emission of CO2, increasing landfill sizes and pollution is the result of these impacts. Rising pollution density and increasing demands for concrete have accelerated the situation. Thus, it is required to go for sustainable concrete construction practices. This webinar is being organized involving renowned panelists from academia, industry, and government departments to discuss the highlight and pertinent issues related to sustainable concrete. The deliberations on these issues are expected to provide us more insight and leave us enriched. I hope the knowledge sharing session will be fruitful and interactive one. I once again compliment office bearers of Kachipuram Local Center and assure them any help which they require from our headquarters. I wish the program all success. Thank you. Over to Ilamuji, our moderator. You can proceed with your agenda. Yes, sir. Uh, President, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can proceed with the agenda. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. My okay. address is over. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Um, Dr. Haji? Hello? Hello. Uh, Okay, sir. Can I? Okay, sir. The Lima Rose ask him to join. Uh, ask him to take this particular role. Uh -huh, you ask him to take over, then I'm seeing. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. okay. Lima Rose, please. Uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. okay. so one minute, sir. Ah, ah, I provide sir, vice article. Okay. Okay, sir. Am I audible, sir? Sir, good morning to everyone joined here. First of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our president, sir, IEI. And then our beloved head of the department, Professor Dr. D. Ilango, sir, chairman, and other, other organizing committee members for giving me the opportunity to present in this uh, wonderful webinar on application of sustainable concrete in modern constructions. So I'm going to take the concept of sustainable development in the construction industry. So is slide is visible, sir. Yes, yes, madam, it is basic. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. So, first, we need to define the concept sustainability. So, what is the, uh, how can we define the term sustainability? So, uh, what we are going, what is the definition exactly for sustainability? So, the term sustainability consists of a combination of two terms, that is, sustain and ability. So, the definition is ability to sustain. So this is very vast and broader, def, uh, broader theme. So the theme sustainability is nothing but ability to sustain. The ability to sustain may be of human being or it may be of animals or it may be of any material or it may be of nature itself. So uh, when we think about the sustainability, immediately we will come in our mind, everything will be in ground. So everything will be in uh, everything will be in green so uh, uh, this is very well definition so that the environment commission on environment uh, in, uh, the, the world commission on environment and development has given the 
definition for uh, sustainability, sustainability development or sustainability is meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their needs. So I am dividing this definition into the three parts. That is present generation without compromising and future generation. What it means? That is when we uh, when we think when we uh, meeting our needs, we have to think about our future generation. So when, while while meeting our needs, we have to taken care of our future generations. This is what the meaning of uh, sustainability. So. So when we looking up into the dimensions of sustainability, we have three important pillars in the sustainability. That is economic growth, environmental protection, and social aspects. This green shaded portion, when we when this economic growth, environmental protection, and social aspects interlinked with one another, we will get sustainability. This green shaded portion is sustainability. So the sustainability of economic growth will be of profit or reducing the cost or investment in uh, to the research and development, etc. Therefore, the sustainability in social aspects or the living standards, availability of education and jobs, and equal opportunities to all the members of the society. So the sustainable sustainability in environmental protection or natural resources, pollution prevention, biodiversity, and eco ecological health. If it is not present there, if environmental protection is not, not there, we should not attain the sustainability. It is not not possible to attain sustainability even the social even the other two pillars that is social aspects and the economic growth hand in hand we are not getting we are not attaining the sustainability so in these three pillars economic growth environmental protection and as social aspects these three pillars are interlinked with one another we will attain the sustainability so what when we looking up into the sustainable construction so sustainable construction mainly use mainly aims to reduce the negative environmental so what it means the negative environmental in the construction industry we are going to we are, we are produce the, the, the uh, larger amount of waste larger amount of pollution so that is what our ultimate aim is we have to reduce the negative environmental impacts generated by our construction industry so the if the material is fully sustainable then the embodied and the operational energy must be low as possible what what you mean by embodied energy so which is nothing but the amount of energy to produce the material is the sustainable uh, construction so when we looking about into the principles of uh, sustainability this is very important so when you looking up into the principles of uh, sustainability the construction industry is very big industry which creates the infrastructure for the country so it provides opportunity to the larger number of people to get the employed so indeed the nation's progress is measured by the progress of construction industry while we looking up into the various materials used in the construction we are make use in we are make use of 90 percentage in reinforced concrete in addition we have the steel structures and other materials materials so the materials of construction designed very optimally so that the cost of the structure becomes economical when we translate the design efforts into the real infrastructure you can find the waste you can generate the waste so when we think about the reinforced concrete structure the form of us, uh, create the uh, waste so uh, it becomes uh, it, 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 we have to we have to make that waste we have to reuse that waste and we have to make it as wealth this is one important issue in the construction industry in the reinforced concrete uh, structure for making the reinforced concrete we need formwork this formwork creates the waste this one important issue in the construction industry again for the while consideration of reinforcement we are not exactly designed the exact dimensions of uh, any cross section for uh, for, uh, for say for beam or uh, column whatever maybe we are not supposed to provide the exact dimensions of the reinforcement definitely the cut pieces 
becomes the waste. So to make the industry sustainable, waste has to be minimized. We have to minimize the waste and also instead of uh, throw it away, we have to make use of it for making any uh, uh, y y y for making any uh, precast structures or whatever may be. So we have to use that waste as a wealth. So reuse the waste, it becomes the wealth in the construction industry industry when we looking up uh, in we, when we looking up into the principles of uh, uh, sustainability we have five important uh, principles uh, that is we may call it as uh, five r principle so refuse reduce reuse recycle or recover so uh, uh, refuse refuse is nothing but we have to we, we have we have to refuse to use the costly materials so so we we go with the alternate solution with the cheaper alternatives we have many alternatives available we have the fly ash for altering the uh, cement we, we we have a rice cast ash for altering uh, uh, sand so like that we have to find we have yen, plenty of materials available so we have go uh, we, we have to go with the alternate solutions with cheaper uh, uh, materials without affecting the quality that is very important without affecting the quality strength and durability so and, and second or second or our second principle is reduce we have to use the optimal section so for example if i want a beam of a size 30 centimeter by uh, 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 70 centimeter uh, so i am using 30 centimeter by 1 meter is uh, i am using the uneconomical section so you we, you we have to avoid the using uneconomical section so we have to go with optimal section so that we can reduce the waste and create the wealth and third r is reuse so in the uh, we, we, as i said earlier we have um, uh, in the reinforcement uh, we are not supposed to use uh, we are not supposed to make exactly the whatever we want the dimension so definitely uh, we, we will have the some cut pieces so that we don't throw away that bits and pieces of materials in the construction industry as waste so that the bit rods uh, that are cut off in fabricating the reinforcement can be reused as window grills the another important issue in the construction industry is ready mix concrete if we are that probably six cubic meter when we consume only five cubic meter that one cubic meter is left thrown out as waste instead of throwing out we can make any precast sections uh, like flooring tiles or garden tiles uh, so we can go with the uh, new techniques and we can make it that waste as a wealth so we can uh, reuse that waste as by making it as wealth and another important uh, uh, principle is recycling so recycling is not using only one times but using the same material over and over again for example centering sheets we should not uh, throw it away after one use we can use we can use it up to its lifetime exist so uh, we can uh, use it over and uh, over and over again for recycling and the last principle is recover that is demolished waste convert non usable waste to usable waste so we, when we considering the construction demolition waste we will have the usable waste and non usable waste we have to convert that non usable wastage into the waste uh, usable waste we can we can recycle it so we can um, we can make it for usable one that is what recovering this is what the fifth principle so these five are important principles in the sustainability and then four important aspects of very specific to the construction importer industry so the reuse of construction demolition waste is the highest priority so old concrete in the old concrete we will have the hardened pots and broken uh, broken and uh, brickwork waste and we will have some old pvc pipes and steel rods so we can use these uh, all four aspects into the construction industry we can reuse of this construction demolition waste which is the highest priority so we can create a stable and efficient market for recycled materials and products and we have to remove all the 
the barriers to the waste minimization. So we have to minimize the waste and use the waste for recycling. So we have to overcome the overcome uh, by adopting the new technology into this uh, construction in the uh, industry. So we we have to overcome the all the barriers and we have to uh, minimize the waste and we use that waste uh, and uh, use that waste as the wealth. So the recycled material could have separate standards. So then only we can make it reusable. So we will be able to make use of 80 to 90% of construction demolition waste. So generally we will have uh, uh, in uh, while considering the uh, economic value for recovered materials, uh, the waste awareness and minimization is very, very important. So we have to minimize the waste. We have to take in steps to uh, use that waste to the uh, recycling material and waste segregation and the home, uh, home composting is very important and product development is important uh, and uh, business investment and development is also important. So specifying recycled in uh, procurement of goods, works and services. So from waste minimization to the procurement uh, are, are all the important aspects in the creating economic value for recovered materials. So when we come coming into, while we're looking up into the material resource efficiency cycle, so uh, the percentage use is very, very, very important. What will be the percentage use we are going to consider for resource efficiency cycle? So the percentage use we are obtaining from a material resource is called material resource efficiency. So the, the material resource efficiency can be divided into two broader parts, that is uh, raw, uh, reduce the raw material use and reduce the waste. While we considering to the reduce the raw material use, uh, we have to save the resources. Uh, when we considering into the reduce the waste, uh, we, we have to reduce the landfills. Uh, again, we re recycled uh, pumping up into the materials with the recycled con content, we can increase the material efficiency. So this uh, material resource efficiency is very, very important. Uh, so while, while, while we increasing the material efficiency, we can reduce the landfill, we can make use of it uh, wealth. So when construction material is resource efficiency, what we are going to taking, uh, uh, what we are going to talking about, we are talking about the waste minimization and the segregation uh, recycling, and we are talking about the renewables. Uh, we are talking about the recycled content and uh, reclaimed materials. So the one of the reclaimed material is old bricks. It can be reused again. So the waste minimization is using the material completely. We have to use all the material completely. So the recycled, con recycled content can be made to be higher so that the waste content becomes lower. All this will contribute to the material resource efficiency. So renewable is the particular aspect in which a damaged item is repaired or renewed so that it is used instead of a new uh, item. So this figure shows the material resource efficiency. So when we can talking about, uh, when we looking about the construction demolition waste, it comes from different sectors. It can come from demolition of uh, bridges, old houses or factories. So it comes from different sources. It is important for us to know the distribution of this waste. So the non-residential non -residential demolition may be of 35% and residential demolition is 15% and uh, non-residential non renovation is 21% and residential Residential renovation is 23%, non-residential new construction is 3% and residential new construction is 5%. So the construction demolished waste can be categorized into the four types that is design, operational, material handling and procurement. These four are important concepts, important factors for uh, reducing the waste, construction demolition waste. So the construction demolition waste comes from the sources like why we are getting the construction demolition waste. What is the reason for getting the construction demolition waste? Because of poor design, poor 
operational and maintenance issue, material handling and procurement policies. These and all the important reasons for uh, getting the construction demolition waste. So the amount of construction demolition waste for a state or city, it is about 12 to 14 million tons per year. So now what constitute this construction demolition waste and what is the quantum in each? So for example, soil and sand, soil, sand and gravel, we are getting 4.2 to 5.14 million tons per year. Uh, bricks and masonry, we are getting the waste 3.6 to 4.40. When, when we considering the concrete, we are getting 2.4 to 3.67. When we look up into the metals, we are getting 0.6 to 0.73 million tons per year. And for bitumen, 0.25 to 0.3 million tons per year wood 0.25 to 0.3 tons per million tons per year and other materials we are getting other waste we are getting 0.1 to 0.15 million tons per year so that the percentage wise the bitumen is about two percent brick is 37 percent soil and other related things is 35 percent this gives you a overall distribution of waste in different categories which are likely to be recyclable resources that are available for the construction industry so that we have to minimize the construction waste. By minimizing the construction waste, we can achieve the sustainable. So we achieve in reducing the input into the landfill area. And hence, the performance of a landfill will be for a longer period, affect, uh, affecting all down into the environment. So we have to minimize the construction waste. So owing to the growth in the construction, it is expected construction demolition waste generation in India will be increased. If measures to minimize the handle, minimize and handle the construction demolition waste are not developed and efficiently adopted, it may it may threat environment as well as the sustainable movement of the country country so that we have to make use of this construction demolition waste without affecting the quality strength and durability we can make use of this construction demolition waste many construct concrete materials can be recycled after initial use as a building pavement or other structure reducing the amount of material that is landfill and the need for the virgin materials in the new construction so uh, so we can avoid the landfills so government policies the our government uh, government has initiated ma many policies for uh, reducing uh, for increasing the sustainability environment and reducing the waste so government policies and laws should be reformed to motivate and make a construction demolition waste management so construction waste management is mandated for all the types of construction activities so we have to take care of this construction waste management we have to reduce the waste and recycle it for uh, proper usage so that the recycling of construction demolition waste by converting it to the aggregate uh, may offer a dual benefit of saving the landfill so when will be uh, used that material as the, one of the concrete material automatically we are saving our precious land and also we are utilizing that material as the construction material so we are saving the landfill uh, space and reduction in extraction of natural raw material for new construction activities so which leading towards the construction uh, sustainable development so uh, we can uh, uh, when we talking about uh, the operational uses of construction industry the waste from construction industry can be split into the inert materials and non inert materials the inert materials are rocks concrete asphalt rubble bricks stones and earth and whereas in the non inert materials are bamboos timber plastic uh, packaging waste. Nowadays, we are getting many packaging waste through the online mode of uh, uh, pro uh, products. So, so packaging waste and other their organic materials. These are all coming under the non-inert materials. This rocks, concrete, asphalt, and rubble bricks, stones, and earths are coming under inert materials. So generally, this inert materials can go with the public fill. And the construction demolition waste is 20% will be the non-inert material. This non-inert material is coming under the construction demolished waste. 
for which we can a stable reuse has to be uh, depending depending upon the material considered as the waste just for the construction uh, for uh, looking at uh, looking into this uh, uh, figure uh, that is uh, the construction demolition material in tons per day we have the construction demolition material 38840 tons per day just imagine out of this, the public fill is 32,430 tons per day. So, mixed construction demolition material is 6,410 uh, uh, tons per day. So, in out of this, the public fill uh, filling area is 32,430. So, we have to reuse that waste. Then only we can avoid this landfill. Then only uh, landfill. Then only we can save our precious landfill. So, we have to make make use of this waste into our construction industry. So, we have to reduce the waste and also we have to reuse that waste. Uh, reuse that waste. Then only we can uh, save our precious lands. So, reduce the waste by reuse, we can able to recover our precious uh, uh, land. So, the, what are the main objectives uh, uh, of the waste reductions in the framework? We have to promote waste minimization and the resource recovery. So, we have many, uh, many applications are available. So, how we have to reduce the minimize? We have to use the optimal uh, section. We have to use exactly optimal. And then you have to uh, make use of that waste in into the resource recovery part. And then we have to prolong the landfill life. We, we, we have to prolong, make use of, uh, prolong the landfill life. And we have to optimizing the waste management costs. These are all the main objectives of uh, the waste reductions in the framework. So for reduction, for reducing the waste reduction, Action. The, uh, our government has uh, initiated many steps. So we have, uh, with, with the help of uh, government, the Waste Reduction Committee has been generated. So the Waste Reduction Committee and Waste Reuse. So we have to reduce the waste instead of uh, uh, using the waste or instead of uh, transporting the waste and dumping into the landfill, we have to reuse that waste. So we, waste reduction and the waste reuse is important instead of uh, uh, transportation and waste uh, dumping into the landfills. In the Waste Reduction Committee, the professional bodies, academicians, uh, project clients, uh, contractors, consulting engineers and government are the members in the Waste Reduction Committee. So, by uh, with the help of uh, the government, we are making the many steps to reduce the uh, waste and we, we have to make use of that waste as uh, wealth and public film management. We have to plan the reclamation project for making, uh, for efficient making the uh, efficient uh, reuse of uh, uh, the waste. Therefore, the waste reduction will achieve in reclaiming learn and converting the waste into the wealth, optimizing waste management cost. So we have to optimize the cut and fill. That is, some portion of the soil has to be cut and some portion of the soil has to be filled. We know. So uh, uh, generally, if the if we, if we are getting soil in one portion, we are using that into the another. So, so this, this is called a sorting and recycling uh, facilities. It, it has to be created to optimize Optimize the waste management cost. So, no part of the construction demolition waste has need to be wasted. So, we have to utilize all the waste and we have to reuse that waste again and again. Then only we will make the sustainable environment. So, we're making uh, so for at attaining the sustainable environment, we will have the uh, different goals. So, we in, in if so, government has initiated many goals. Out of this, we have taken care of uh, these three important goals, that is energy, materials, and water. So, energy. So, energy is very important source to make the sustainable environment in the construction industry. So, we have to reduce the energy spent in the factories and construction sites. So, we have to reduce, uh, that is, we have to use the locally available materials. Then only we can avoid the transportation. Then only we can reduce the energy spent in the, into the factories and construction site. And by reducing the material usage, the energy gets reduced. This is energy optimization by waste minimization. So, we have to use optimum size for anything. So, then only we can reduce the material usage, then only we can get optimized uh, 
uh, uh, optimize the usage and waste minimization. So when the materials, the conservation of material is very important. So the methods of minimizing materials are optimizing the design and proper construction and use the proper for construction technology so we have plenty of materials we have to use that material without affecting the uh, quality of the construction we have to use that material that is what the optimizing the design we have to use exact design we have to make exact um, uh, uh, proper construction uh, exact uh, sections so properly we have to use that materials and uh, we, uh, we 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 have we, we without affecting the quality that is very very important and we have how to maintain the strength and durability and water we have many uh, technology uh, in the construction industry without using the water we have many technology so use that modern technology to construct without water uh, use the curing compounds instead of using uh, curing we can use the curing compounds for curing purpose so they make construction with water economical so in the sustainable uh, so in sustainable construction practices is uh, very 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 important uh, so in the construct uh, in the sustainable uh, construction pro uh, practices we have five important key factors that are now design integration material selection resource conservation lean manufacturing trend techniques and construction waste management. These five are very important in the construction practices. So while considering the design integration, so the stakeholders are very, very, very important. So uh, client, a client is very important a stakeholder and structural engineers, contractors, landscape architect, architect, mechanical, electrical, uh, plumbing consultants, project management consultants, and uh, green building professionals so uh, this the, the, they are all the stakeholders so for any construction project to be sustainable the design must be very 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 important so we have to make the sustainable design that is design must be in line with the end user requirement and then design integration it helps to clearly understand the design challenges and the responsibilities of each team. So each and every one must understand our responsibility. We have to face the challenges in the construction industry. That is very important for making the, for attaining the sustainable environment. So a thorough study about designability and constructability aspects results into the conflict free design. When you are using the free, any material, any new material, we must know about about the thorough knowledge about that material so then only we can we, we can uh, maintain the quality and we can sustain the strength and durability so we must have the thorough study for designability constructability um, uh, which results the sustainability aspects so the involvement of uh, so the involvement of stakeholders as well as all experts help to arrive at a mutual consensus on a particular design issue. So we helps to the, the design integration helps to reduce the rework and waiting times and over processing. So design integration is one of the important aspect in the uh, uh, construction in the sustainable infrastructure. So in the material selection, uh, that is very, very, very important. Material selection is very, very important. So the encourage to use of locally available construction materials that is uh, 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 that is local sourcing as i said earlier we have discussed earlier we have to use uh, the local available construction material then only we can save the energy so uh, reduces the transportation energy we have to reduce the uh, carbon emissions how can we reduce the carbon emission instead of cement we have to go with any cheaper alternative material without affecting the quality of construction so reduce the carbon emissions uh, and add quality which impacts due uh, due to the material transportation so the transportation energy accounts for total 20 to 25 percent of total construction energy so use that translates to 20 to 25 percent of a uh, green gas uh, greenhouse gas emissions so strive for material efficiency 
and design for durability. So now we have to be being the professionals, sir. We have to take care of durability. So IS four five six two thousand describes about the durability. So we have to design it for durability. That is one of the important. In addition to many of many of uh, are focusing the strength, but they are not uh, concentrating the durability. Durability is one of the important uh, criterion. So in addition to the strength, we have to focus on the durability. So we will get the low maintenance and long life selection of material that aids the adaptability and the deconstruction. So uh, and, and selection of material is very important. Before that, we must, as I said earlier, we must know the thorough knowledge about that material. Based on that, we have to select the material with the strength to cost ratio. So, and then use of renewable or waste materials in the buildings. These are all the important factors considered in the material selection. And then resource conservation. So here uh, we will have uh, the four important parameters that is uh, land conservation, energy conservation, water conservation, and uh, material conservation. When we looking up into the land conservation, we have to use adaptive reuse of existing building and the location of construction project site, which is very close to the existing infrastructure and development of non-arable lands for the construction. So what are the factors to be considered for the water conservation? We have to use water efficient plumbing fixtures and we have to collect the rain water and we have make use of that rain water and we employ the recirculating systems and designing the low demand and the land uh, landscaping. So energy conservation is very, very, very important for making the sustainable to attain the sustainable environment so low energy intensive transportation energy efficient technological process choice of materials and construction methods and energy efficient deconstruction and recycling material conservation so material conservation is nothing but a usage of uh, uh, waste that waste uh, waste reutilization we have to we have the plenty of materials here so we have to make use of it uh, reutilize it we have to make the optimum section and durable material we have to use the durable material for the construction we have to use the natural and local materials and non-toxic materials are coming under uh, the material conservations so uh, in the lean uh, manufacturing techniques so digital tools uh, which is such as uh, value stream mapping, VSM, uh, lost planner system, total project management, auto disk, BIM 360, industrialized the buildings. We have to adopt the latest techniques into our uh, construction industry. So the integration of lean construction technology helps to determine the value of the project waste and unnecessary process identification. It identifies the effective method of delivery. It enhances the transparency through the documentation. It enables the reviews and the corrections. These are all coming under um, lean uh, construction industry and then construction waste management how can we may manage the waste the, how can make it responsible the responsible management of waste is an essential aspect of sustainable construction practice a construction waste management plan must be chalked out the selection of proper waste collection method helps to achieve 75 percent landfill avoidance when we use this construction uh, demolition waste we can save the landfill uh, almost 75 percent with the sophisticated haulers the waste can be separated easily on the site and off site raw construction demolition waste debris can be diverted and used as a resource uh, for example waste concrete or masonry can be crushed on site and used for the drainage base so So why we have to discuss about concrete? Why we are going to uh, uh, discuss about the traditional concrete? In the traditional concrete, almost, uh, this is a widely used material uh, second to the water. So we are getting 2.5 tons of concrete produced each year for every human being. So the cement manufacturing generate 5% of 
global greenhouse gases so cement constitutes more than two third of total embodied energy of country so the annual glo global cement production is 2.8 billion tons cement production capacity in india to reach 550 million tons by 2020 so the per capita consumption of cement in india is 190 kg per year so the per capita consumption of cement is globally 500 kg per year so the one ton of cement production releases 0.9 ton of co2 so one ton of cement consumed in concrete absorbs 0.4 ton of co2 while hardening hence the net amount of co2 releases by one ton cement by 0.5 ton of co2 so estimate the emissions of co2 based on the annual consumptions of cement so we have to reuse cement we have to uh, avoid the usage of cement we have to make alternate materials to reduce the quantity of cement so that reduce the quantity of cement without compromise compromising that is very important that is what the sustainability def definition so without compromising the construction quality use the alternatives or secondary products for the cement we can use the fly ash for example we can use it we can use it up to 20 percent we can use it fly ash so what are all the available sources we have uh, we, uh, we have fly ash blast furnish slag cinders copper tailings red mud kiln my uh, kiln dust bagasses ice dusts uh, sawmill waste marble dust um, and then water treatment is used uh, incinerated sludge so these are all the sources of uh, these materials so we have uh, plenty of ma alternate materials we have to choose the material so we have to reuse uh, uh, for the cement and other uh, construction material and we have to make a sustainable infrastructure how can we make the sustainable infrastructure as we discussed earlier as you know very well sustainable infrastructure refers to the designing building and operation of infrastructural elements in a way that do not diminish the social economic and ecological process these three are the important three important pillars in the sustainability so we, we do we do not diminish the social economic and ecological process and we have to maintain the human equity diversity and functionality of natural systems so infrastructure is very critical to sustain uh, sustainable development so we have to taken care of uh, main uh, uh, taken care of uh, making the sustainable infrastructure what are the important uh, uh, factors uh, influences the uh, sustainable infrastructure green energy green transport land use planning waste management in in addition to this proper proper governance is important these are all the important infrastructures what are the paradigm shift from traditional to uh, sustainable design and construction the uh, in the traditional is unsustainable mode of methodology in that we have focused only on time cost and quality whereas in the new paradigm that is in the sustainable design and construction we are considering the minimal negative environmental impact we are literally we are reducing the um, negative environmental impact and we are using that waste as wealth and the human satisfaction is very important in the sustainable industry and the minimum consumption of energy is in addition to the time cost and quality we are focusing towards the minimal negative environment mental impact human satisfaction and the consumption of energy and practices so sustainable construction practices are the ones that fits well with the goals of sustainable development as well as serve to contribute or support or advance sustainable development by reducing the risk enhancing the cost effectiveness improving the process efficiency creating the processes products or services that are any not environmentally benign why benefiting the humans that is very important as we discussed earlier for making the sustainable construction social environmental and economic aspects are very 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 important so uh, we have discussed earlier all those things for making the advancement in a concrete technology we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, use the best approaches in the sustainability construction that is use optimum cement content in the concrete make a compulsory use of supplementary cementitious material so we can uh, get the uh, strength and also we can make the in the ductility so make compulsorily use of supplementary cementitious material and produce 
more durable concrete to increase the life of the structure. So use recycled material again and again. Then only we can avoid the industrial waste. So we can use the industrial waste and recycled materials and use organic chemical admixture so that we can uh, we can reduce the water content. So all the above basically guiding us towards the selection of appropriate alternative materials. So life cycle assessment. When you focusing on sustainability, life cycle assessment is very, very, very important. So life cycle assessment is an approach for evaluating that is from the raw material extraction to the product disposal of recycling. So this is very important. Life cycling, uh, life cycling assessment. So the environmental impact of process and products during the life cycle is important. So in this, uh, the material processing and shipping, product manufacturing and packaging, product shipping, product usage and product disposal are important factors in the life cycle assessment. So we have many materials in the construction materials. So the construction material constitutes major aspects of delivery of the buildings and infrastructure and habitable square meter of living space within the building could require up to 2.3 tons of 100 different construction material. Just imagine we are getting uh, uh, 100 different construction material as uh, literature as per the literatures. So we have different materials. I have shown some of the materials, wood, glass, iron and the steel. So these are all the different, I have uh, uh, shown here some of the construction materials, uh, su su construction that is sustainable construction materials here. So uh, when we uh, when we looking up into the uh, construction material, in the past, the critical factors, uh, that is the choice of construction material is only based on the cost and availability and aesthetic appearance but nowadays uh, the procurement uh, the material procurement is based on the resource efficiency energy and carbon human satisfaction and the environmental health risk that is very important uh, and support for the sustainable process uh, resource efficiency while uh, looking into the resource efficiency the materials with a high reusability and the recycle or uh, recyclability to aid a reduction in continuous extraction of resources for new materials so what are the, the factors aid in resource efficiency, we, are, we can use agricultural waste, materials made from industrial waste, renewable materials and procuring from agent. These are all the very important. When we're looking up into the energy and carbon, the materials with low levels of embodied energy, this involves the risk reliance on materials that requires fossil sources of energy for the manufacturing. So the factors that may aid use of minimally processed materials, materials that rely on extraction or manufacturing techniques with low energy use and water use or pollution material made with any uh, renewable energy these are all very important uh, factors in the energy and carbon consideration human or environmental health risk the materials with the least impact on uh, construction works or uh, safety is important this, ref this refers to the need to select the materials with the cognizance uh, with the ability to contribute the social and general well-being and support to the sustainable processes this refers to the material that support uh, sustainable construction pr uh, process so as we discussed earlier, life cycle assessment. So our life cycle concept is increasingly recognized as a decision support concept for here, the resource of material extraction, the life cycle cost is nothing but resource of material uh, extraction to the recycling or reuse of this uh, uh, disposal. So we are focusing the applications of uh, construction products, components and materials and the whole system. We have to consider the entire system or process. Uh, uh, process evaluation. So we have to focus the boundaries of uh, life cycle assessment and however reflect only the most critical components of the facility being assessed. So if when we want the sustainable concrete must be durable, durability is the ability to resist weathering, weathering on action. So for making the sustainable concrete, durability is very, very, very important. So 
we have to take care of durability so chemical attack and abrasion while maintaining desired engineering properties are very important and then concrete structures require different types of durability depending upon the exposure environment and des desired engineering properties so a durable material benefits the environment by conserving the resources reducing the worst and environmental impacts related to the repair and replacement at the end for sustainability materials in the structure shall be recycled and reused without any waste left for the disposal so the service life on element would demand repair and rehabilitation or replacement so repairs or replacement implies additional effort to the energy so a sustainable concrete structure shall exhibit the longer service life and longer repair cycle so for making the uh, modern construction techniques so for making the uh, construction in industry uh, sustainable while attaining the sustainable in uh, 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 for our achieving the sustainability we have to go with the modern construction techniques so the monolithic nowadays we are focusing the monolithic concrete construction using animal aluminium formwork that is my one techniques this technology was uh, developed by european country in 1990 from malaysia so this my one technique is my my one technique is nothing but the aluminium form work it give, gives the giving the name as the my one technology so this is innovative form work suitable for constructing the houses in the large volumes at the foster faster rate we can use reuse it 285 times approximately we can use reuse this formwork um, 285 times so easy to handle this uh, lightweight panels uh, uh, fitting and direction by wall type pin and wedge system reinforcing steel is used here we are not uh, the column and beam is not necessary it has to be eliminated here and 3 system is to be implemented here that is speed strength and safety is important in the construction industry so this three a system is implemented in the my one technology so this is the example for my one shuttering so next we will move on to prefabricated structure so in the cast in situ construction which is not satisfies the green requirement so low carbon and sustainable development requirement that is in the prefabrication system so prefabrication we know the practice of assembling the components of a structure in the factory or other manufacturing site and transporting all into the all assemblies or sub assemblies into the construction site we have to make the prefabricated uh, structure uh, uh, economically so the prefabricated housing system is a green environmental protection system energy saving and extensively used in residential commercial and construction projects so uh, to overcome uh, this uh, prefabrication overcomes the deficiencies in the traditional construction method of methodology in addition we can make the good quality structure and reduces the construction period and save the material and free from the noise and dust pollutions so uh, how can we uh, what will be the scientific approach in the con concrete design that is optimization of uh, particle packing will improve so in this optimization we have to con take in care of strength cost ratio and we have to make the concrete sustainability so we have to uh, avoid the usage of cement so we have to use the less cement and improving the packing uh, parameters that is it leads to the increase of the compressive and stainless strength workability and durability and we have to decrease the porosity while uh, automatically while optimizing the packing we will reduce the porosity and the risk of uh, segregation and yield stresses so they and improve the skill level in the industry so this this is what the scientific approach to the concrete design so we have to make use of uh, innovations in the con uh, construction uh, concrete industry need to take a more uh, ho holistic uh, view and uh, we have to avoid the barriers we have to avoid the uh, barriers to the innovations uh, that are low skill level for innovation to occur the skill level will have to improve to achieve the sustainability require people in the industry to do and training alternatives would be examined and uh, assessed
uh, what will be the research going on in use of uh, emerging technologies uh, so we have to go with uh, repair and rehabilitation technology ultra high strength concrete and nanotechnology these are all the emerging technologies uh, in uh, uh, emerging technologies uh, uh, so that how the potential to significantly contribute to the sustainable concrete industry well considering the repair and rehabilitation the evaluation of tools and modeling technologies uh, high tech long term health monitoring systems performance based durability design new repair materials and systems durability of repair systems smart materials and systems field process technologies and improved we will have the improved management system for existing the infrastructure while considering into the repair and rehabilitation of structure when we look up into the ultra high strength concrete we will have the unique combination of properties superior strength and good ductility and good durability and lighter and durability structures it requires less raw materials it requires less energy and generating the fewer uh, co2 emissions when we look up into the nanotechnology in concrete nano catalyst to reduce the clinkering temperature in cement production and then silicon dioxide nanoparticle which results for ultra high strength concrete so the incorporation of carbon nanotubes into the cement matrix would results in the uh, stronger ductile and the more energy absorbing uh, concrete so eco binders which are uh, eco binders uh, that is uh, uh, magnesium oxide geopolymers uh, and uh, which are modified by nanoparticles with a sustainability reduce the volume of uh, portland cement what will be the role of uh, uh, structural and civil engineers so civil engineer have have a leading role in planning designing building and ensuring a sustainable future by providing the bridge between the science and society so in this role engineers in active collaborations with multidisciplinary teams with other professionals such as ecologist economist and the sociologist and work with the communities to effectively address the issues and challenges of sustainable development what are all the critical elements in the sustainable infrastructure justified life cycle cost minimize the use of non renewable sources and plan for the resilience see this is what the important uh, critical elements of uh, sustainable infrastructure uh, what will be the base for civil uh, and uh, structural engineers to contribute so we have to shift from the traditional uh, uh, traditional uh, 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 construction methodology to the sustainable construction methodology we have to shift uh, from uh, traditional to sustainable environment uh, and construction industry to adopt uh, sustainable practices in the design planning and construction and then uh, uh, construction sector needs to be revamped that is in order to make economically viable environmentally benign and socially acceptable this is very important to make the uh, industry construction industry uh, sustainable one so this is uh, uh, this diagram shows the center for sustainable development in montreal so this is the uh, which is located in canada it was built to serve as a model for environmentally conscious construction it considered uh, by many to be uh, the greenest building in canada this is a five story living wall it uh, that acts as natural air filter counter tops uh, that are made from recycled glass geothermal heating and cooling systems and raised for floor heating so it it, it even features uh, artwork on display made from 100% organic materials this is uh, the sustainable architecture again another architecture picture sustainable picture uh, which is located in india so this is on one earth is an office building uh, which is located 
constructed in Pune and designed by engineer Charles Christopher. Uh, one year is India's first 100% energy campus, uh, an on-site sewage treatment plant, and it recycles 100% rainwater and 100% grey water is recycled into the air cooling and uh, landscaping systems, uh, attesting to one year's uh, water efficiency. So this is another uh, example for sustainable architecture, uh, which is um, located in Beijing. Uh, so. Uh, um, so roadmap to develop the sustainable housing. So create lasting innovations. When we lost in the construction demolition, we have to create the lasting innovation, not only to protect the industry's future viability, but also the health of our environment. Accord, adequate focus on recycling and creating sustainable construction designs with the combined aim of reducing the disposal cost and conserving the natural resources. Remember that the issue is not environmental versus development or ecology versus economy so the two must be integrated to ensure to get the better future so we being the professionals we need to adopt the following sustainable concrete technology to meet the infrastructure and needs the protect environment use more supplementary cementing materials and recycle and reuse of concrete use life cycle cost approach to seek better and durable concrete structures and research and use of emerging technology that is repair and rehabilitation technology to extend the service life of infrastructure so this is very important dear learners this is very important think about the reality and accept the responsibility and learn re new things and make many research thank you thank you one and all thank you ma'am thank you for your informative presentation Uh, sir, shall we call next uh, panelist, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You just uh, few small introduction. Yeah. Aji, sir. Sorry, yes, sir. sorry for uh, delay. Ibrahim, proceed, Ibrahim. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doctor M S Haji Mo Haji Sheikh Mohammed, sir, completed his B E M S and P H D in College of Engineering, Gindi, Anna University. Currently, he is working as a professor of civil engineering and dean academic affairs at B S Abdul Rahman. Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai. He is also director of a Center for Prevention and Control of Corrosion in Concrete Structures at Crescent Innovation Incubation Council. He served in the construction industry for more than 16 years in various capacities as field engineer, senior engineer, technical manager, and senior consulting engineer. He successfully completed corrosion control technologies in various projects in India, including Andaman and Nicobar Islands. He also involved in the development of new corrosion control products and has expertise in the rehabilitation of corrosion affected structures. Dr. M. S. Haji Sheikh Mumar, sir, guided 69 MTech projects, two MTech by research dissertation, and 10 BTech projects in the area of protective coating to steel rebars, corrosion inhibitors, polymer modified composites, waterproofing of RCC structures, durable ferrocement panels. PSWC bars, sacrificial anode cathodic protection, etc. Currently, he is guiding seven PhD scholars. He has 19 journal publications, 22 international conferences, workshops, and 30 conference proceedings to his credit in his research area. His professional affiliations are he is a senior member in RILAM, member in Association of Material Protection and Performance, affiliated member in American Society of Civil Engineers. Life member in Indian Concrete Institute and fellow member in Association of Consulting Civil Engineers India. And I request to Dr. M. S. Haji Sheikh Mumal sir to give the keynote lecture. Please, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ibrahim, for the nice introduction. Uh, in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. H.O. H. O. Thakare, sir. President uh, IEI for giving me this opportunity. I also want to thank Dr. Ilango, Chairman, Kanji Brahm Local Center, 
and Dr. G. Sanmuga Sundaram, Honorary Secretary, Kanjavaram Local Center, and my Dean, Dr. Vasanthi Ma'am, uh, for this opportunity. So I will uh, straight away uh, start with my presentation. The voice is audible, screen is visible. Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Voice is also audible. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the topic is galvanized steel rebars for a durable and sustainable uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, myself, MS, Dr. M.S. Haji Sheikh Muhammad. Uh, actually, Dr. Lima Rose uh, very holistically covered the various salient aspects of the uh, sustainable concrete, sustainable construction. Uh, uh, according to me, it's a ocean, sustainable concrete and sustainable construction. I'll be presenting a, a a one method for improving the durability of the concrete, which leads to the sustainability, which is immediately possible for implementation. The overview of presentation is introduction to durable and sustainable concrete, uh, galvanized steel rebars, the mechanism of corrosion resistance, uh, significance of galvanized steel rebars, and performance studies and research findings. Uh, the need for durable construction. First, every uh, actually this is the order of the day. The durable construction is the order of the day. Uh, since we are seeing daily in the newspapers, uh, buildings are uh, uh, actually the particularly the roof slabs are peeling without any warning. Even in the last week in Mumbai, one building collapsed without giving a warning. So this is under the serious issue. So all the civil engineering fraternity is worried about the durable construction. So durable construction means it shall resist again physical and chemical deteriorating mechanisms. Uh, physical means it should offer good resistance to permeability, recent thaw resistance, suppression, erosion resistance. A uh, chemical means it should have a resistance against carbon dioxide penetration, chloride penetration, and alkali aggregate reaction, sulfate attack, acid attack, etc. So durability means in the nutshell, it is trouble free free for both clients and the contractors. Sustainable concrete, very really elaborately covered by Dr. Lima Rose. In a nutshell, uh, the total environmental impact during the life cycle, including its use, is minimal. That only we call it as sustainable concrete structure. So naturally, in the sustainable concrete, uh, we need material which offers very low inherent energy. And we also have to use playage type of supplementary cementitious materials. And we have to consume the most plentiful resources than consuming the very scarce resources. And we should explore the option of using recycle materials. So these are the basics. So main aspects in the sustainable concrete construction is durability. If we take care of the durability of the concrete structures, then suppose if you design the building for 50 years, 50 years it served its purpose and uh, then it would lead to the sustainability. Nowadays we are seeing the, con the structures constructed in the coastal belt suffer yearly distress within 10, 15 years and for repairing and replacing, we are using so much of cement which leads to uh, opposite to their sustainability. So this is a very, very important aspect. Uh, considering our, our mother India, we have we blessed with 7,516 kilometers of coastal belt. Uh, most of the developed cities are lies in the coastal belt. Moreover, as a developing country, we are doing so much in the roadways, railways, ports, airports, urban and rural and industrial development. Our budget for the 2025 is 102 lakh crores for the infrastructure development according to the union budget. So the problem is uh, durability here. So we are spending so much of money in the development. At the same time, most of the development we are expected in the coastal belt where the durability is of immense importance. Actually, we need a balanced approach. Uh, Madam covered ex extensively about the uh, concrete. Uh, so as a civil engineers, we use reinforced cement concrete. So steel is an inevitable material. So we have to give equal emphasis for steel and concrete. 
so steel we have to everyone we have to understand that um, steel will corrode it's a natural phenomenon we can we can't do anything we can we cannot prevent corrosion but we can control the corrosion so what are the care we are taking for the concrete we have to take for the steel also so that the structure is a uh, durable fulfill its service life then it will lead to large huge savings in the uh, cement consumption and other material usages manpower requirement and it will indirectly leads to the ecological development ecological improvement and sustainability so we we should concentrate on the synergistic synergistic effect of both steel and concrete rather than concentrating only on steel or on concrete so uh, these are the uh, uh, pictures or photos from some of the ongoing projects you can see that uh, already uh, so rebar started corroding even if you use a yeah, durable concrete or sustainable concrete in this it won't solve its purpose already rust stains are rust stains are going down and definitely there will be a reduction in the original diameter so if you use these things Uh, and without uh, uh, without uh, taking care of the corrosion aspects within 5 to 10 years these are the things will happen there will be a spalling cracking in the rcc members spalling delamination so which will lead to the structural distress and sometime a catastrophic failure as we see in the newspapers every week we are seeing some catastrophic failure without giving any warning building or collapse so there are two aspects uh, which are very much important in, in terms of uh, corrosion control or corrosion prevention in steel rebars one is carbonation and second one is chloride so most of the participants are students uh, very simply carbonation means a carbon dioxide intrusion chloride intrusion naturally the chloride we know so the carbon dioxide in the dry seasons will go and occupy the pores of the concrete during rainy season it combines with water and converted into carbonic acid this carbonic acid has the tendency to reduce the ph of the concrete the original ph of the concrete is 12 to 13 once it reduces because of this carbon carbon carbonic acid effect once the ph of the concrete is reduced to 9 then no more the concrete will give protection to the steel and steel corrosion will accelerate and will lead to the distress so in case of carbonation the corrosion formation over the steel rebar is uniform corrosion whereas in the chloride induced corrosion the it is much more significant than the carbonation induced here the local attack will happen if the chloride combined in the corrosion reaction Uh, ferric chloride will form and the, there is a formation of hydrochloric acid so wherever the chloride concentration is more there is a formation of hydrochloric acid type of thing and it will, and it will lead to the pitting pitting uh, just to imagine this type of pitting happens in the pre stressed strands then it will lead to catastrophic failure so these two mechanisms we have to control a uh, mechanism of corrosion very simply uh, uh, students need not worry about the equations once corrosion happens what is the immediate significance there is a growth of corrosion products around the steel once so there is a increase in volume uh, we have to mind it the original diameter is reduced but there is an increase in volume around the steel rebar once the, the, there is an adequate increase in volume it will offer pressure to the surrounding concrete that only we are seeing as a spalling and delamination in the day to day life if we visit 10 houses in two three houses you can easily see the delamination or cracking or spalling so concrete is strong in compression but weak in tension all of us know so the build up of rust around the steel rebar will create pressure to the surrounding concrete because of that only we are seeing a cracking and spalling of concrete Uh, we have to understand one more thing that rust in various form the volume increase is up to six times the original diameter suppose 10 grams of uh, steel is involved in corrosion 
there is a possibility that the 10 grams is grow up to 6.4 times by volume. So there is a huge development of a deposition of corrosion product around the steel, which will give only pressure. You can see this from this uh, picture. There is a vertical crack. It is due to the volume growth by uh, rust. As a corrosion prevention method, uh, the best actually the basic uh, practice we have to follow in the site is proper storage of rebar. So we have to give adequate cover and mix ratio. We have to take care of mix design and we have to use best construction practices. These are mandatory. These are mandatory. In addition to that, we have to go for some corrosion prevention methods like protective coating to steel rebars, uh, admixing corrosion inhibitors in concrete. Uh, protective coating to concrete and uh, addition of mineral and chemical admixtures and nowadays recently evolving uh, technique is sacrificial anode cathodic protection. So the nutshell the information is in addition to the basic care in terms of uh, manufacturing a concrete we need to have additional measures uh, to as a preventive strategy for protecting the steel rebars so that the synergistic effect the concrete, quality concrete, a quality reinforcement will offer durable buildings. Uh, in this lecture, I'll be mostly concentrating on a coating for anti-corrosive coating for steel reinforcement rods. Uh, commonly, nowadays, we are using in India a fusion bonded epoxy coating and cement polymer composite coating. A galvanized, a galvanized rebars are very rarely used in some projects in India. So the first two coatings are non-metallic coatings. The galvanization is a metallic coating. What is the requirement of uh, any protection system? Any corrosion resistant system should offer excellent resistance against carbonation and chloride attack. That's a mandatory. Then whatever the system we are using, it should not affect the bond strength development between steel and concrete. This is very, very important and it should offer excellent addition to the base metal. Uh, other things are, if you adopt some coating, it should be tolerable against coating damage and during handling, placing and transportation at all. Uh, it should, uh, it should be, we should be in a position to handle with least effort. I'll show you some of the photographs taken at site. Uh, this is the rebar, fusion bonded epoxy coated rebar. Uh, used in the construction site in Chennai. Uh, actually, we are spending, government is spending so much uh, crores of rupees as a uh, prevention strategy, but in the, due to the poor construction practices in the site, poor handling, uh, even before the concreting, uh, pitting corrosion, uh, actually the coating is disturbed and some corrosion is happening. So, so we have to be very careful if we are going for a prevention strategies, we have to stack the rebars actually as per the manufacturer's guidelines. And these are some of the photos taken at site where the usage of cement polymer composite coating, again, the poor construction practice uh, and all leads to the uh, corrosion of the coated rebar itself before concreting. So the, the thing we have, we are actually these are again a picture a very poor construction uh, practice, not even a, actually these rebars has to be stored over the uh, wooden planks uh, that, that even a basic the procedures not follow. The key message from this uh, site photos from the site is, uh, site condition is uh, non-metallic coatings are with poor abrasion resistance will have poor corrosion resistance. So metallic coatings with good abrasion resistance and corrosion resistance is the way to go. So nowadays, galvanized rebars are emerging in the Indian market. So we have to think of uh, using these uh, galvanized rebars in the upcoming projects. Uh, Non-metallic coatings, very well we can use, but we have to take care in the manufacturing process, storage at site, and until concretizing is done, we should take care. Galvanized rebar, yeah, newly emerging, uh, although it is uh, extensively used in the Europe, some European countries, Australia, Singapore, uh, still in the Indian market, it yet to evolve in a big way. 
So this is basically a metallic coating. Uh, moreover, it will give sacrificial protection to the steel. Uh, another uh, uh, salient feature is it is a factory process. Uh, these are some of the projects uh, uh, where the galvanized rebar is used. Uh, deep tunnel sewage system in Singapore, uh, New Watford Bridge in Bermuda, uh, Boca Chica Bridge in USA. In India, the Lotus Temple is constructed using uh, this galvanized rebar constructed during uh, 1886. Even now, it is fine. There is no signs of corrosion. A Parliament House of Australia is constructed using this bar and many projects worldwide. Uh, these are the typical view of the uh, galvanized rebars the site conditions. Uh, since it is a metallic coating, uh, no need for the extra care during, uh, uh, during transportation, handling and other things. Since it is metallic, its uh, mechanical properties are almost equivalent to the steel. So, so the property is taken care of from abrasion and impact resistance. Uh, there are two manufacturing processes for uh, for manufacturing galvanized rebars. Uh, that's first one is hard dip galvanization. The second one is a continuous galvanization. Uh, hard dip galvanization, it is a factory process. So you have to supply the rebar to the galvanization unit where uh, they will have this assembly. Uh, they will have an acid tank, an alkaline water tank, then a coating bath, a zinc, coat, uh, a zinc coating bath, then uh, another tank for uh, applying a sodium dichromate solution. So this process will take care of uh, 10 to 15 minutes, the process time, and total hours we can consider within two hours, we can complete the complete operations. So the salient steps in the hard dip galvanization in the batch process, in the factory process is, uh, first, a rust removal is done by uh, pickling in acid solution. Then acid neutralization is done by cleaning with water in the second tank. Then one flux solution is applied over this uh, rust-free rebar to improve the adhesion between the uh, uh, rust-free rebar and the zinc. Then it is immersed in molten zinc of, uh, of temperatures 450 degrees centigrade. Then quenching in sodium dichromate solution. Uh, don't worry about this process step. This is as per Indian standards and ISO standards. These are the normal step they follow in the any galvanization unit. Uh, nowadays, this is a very, very new technique. It's uh, coming in India, continuous galvanization. So the first one is batch gal galvanization, where you have to supply the rebar to the galvanization unit. Here, in the continuous galvanization, uh, during the manufacturing of steel itself, this galvanized coating is done. And from the steel manufacturers, you can uh, purchase the galvanized rebars. Uh, recently, uh, one uh, continuous galvanization unit is established in Punjab and more units to come in India. The here, after the manufacturing of the conventional uh, steel rebar in the steel plant, and then the, it is subjected to shoot blasting operation to make the surface of the uh, rebar bit rough. Then fluctuation is applied here. Then it is heated to 450 degrees centigrade. The batch process, the earlier one batch process, the rebar is uh, dipped in the molten zinc. Here the rebar is heated to 450, then passed through the zinc alloy a trough, then they have some measures to control the thickness and you will find the galvanized rebar. Uh, I also visited this unit. It will take around uh, 15 to 20 minutes to complete all the operations. So the advantage in this process is uh, you will uh, get the galvanized rebar from the steel manufacturer itself. Now we will try to understand the mechanism of working of this galvanized rebar. Uh, this is very, very important. According to the bimetallic corrosion theory, uh, if you connect two dissimilar materials, the less inferior material will corrode and it will protect the noble material. 
uh, here in this picture, this is the uh, basic of the galvanization process. Here you can see these two nuts are made with different materials. So the, the rusted one is less inferior, inferior material. The nut is made with inferior material. And this one is with much more noble material. Since we have connected these two nuts, two dissimilar materials, the less, the more inferior material corrodes by protecting the noble material. So this logic only used in the galvanization process. If you apply zinc coating over the steel in the electrochemical series, we can see that uh, zinc is beneath the ion steel. So if we apply a zinc coating over the steel, zinc will sacrifice by protecting the steel. So that logic only used in the galvanization product. Here, another, this photo, you can see the nut is a noble material, bolt is an inferior material. So if we apply zinc coating, zinc is the less noble material compared to the steel. So whenever the corrosion conditions happens, the zinc slowly sacrifice so that the main metal will not get affected. Uh, some of you may ask how long it will protect. Easily, uh, depending upon the thickness of the coating, we can give, we can design the structure for its service life. Uh, this is another uh, mechanism. If uh, consider this as a steel rebar, in the, if the hard dip galvanization is done, uh, four layers will form over the steel rebar. Uh, first one is gamma, delta, zeta, eta. This four layer will form. So why these four layers are forming over the steel rebar? By simple dipping in the galvanization processes, depending upon the, uh, uh, depending upon the curing conditions, the, the surface immediately, the zinc immediately touches the steel rebar, you will have alloy of 75% zinc and 25% of Fe. If you go up, the zinc content is more, the topmost layer is a pure zinc. So when this galvanized rebar is embedded in the fresh concrete, so what will happen normally in the reinforced concrete, hydration process takes place, concrete slowly hard, so the hydration process taken in the cement so that it will release a heat. Accordingly, there will be a gel formation and this gel uh, connects the coarse aggregate and fine aggregate and it will adhere to the steel rebar and a RC member is formed. So when the, steel, when the cement react with the topmost, uh, topmost pure zinc, a passivation layer is formed in the interface between the galvanized rebar and the cement concrete. This passivation layer is formed means then it will offer a very good protection to the steel. So it will take in care of for a longer period. So here you are seeing the interface, interfacial transition zone between galvanized rebar and concrete. One advantage in galvanized rebars, as I have mentioned in the previous slide, when the corrosion conditions are critical, then zinc corrodes and protect the steel. What is the difference between steel corrosion and zinc corrosion is, when steel corrodes, the volume is increasing in a higher rate and moreover, the size of the particle is more. Here in the zinc corrosion, zinc also corrodes, protect the steel but it is a powdery type of material. These zinc powders can penetrate inside and sometimes closes the pores in the concrete microstructure. So this is an added advantage if we go for galvanized rebars. In addition to the protection of, uh, of steel, so the zinc corrosion products travels through the concrete and closing the pores. This is clearly visible in this sun picture. So what are the advantages of the galvanized rebar? It offers a uniform coating thickness. Uh, these are uh, some uh, uh, cross-section some pictures, uniform thickness, uh, protection at corners. Even if you bend, nothing will happen. Uh, since the properties, mechanical properties of the zinc is almost 
even in some aspects more than the steel. So nicely, the curvature will happen without any crack and improved abrasion resistance, metallurgy. It's a metallurgical bonding. So you cannot break the bonding. Unlike the non-metallic coatings, you can break the bonding between steel and concrete. Here, it's very difficult. You cannot. Moreover, no special precautions are required. Just like that, you can use a normal rebar. Uh, this slide is uh, very, very important. Uh, this uh, slide shows the uh, time versus uh, stress in the building. And the uh, green color curve shows the fluoride profile at rebar surface. You can clearly see that at a lower chloride level, at a lower chloride level, if you use uncoated rebar, the distress is started, the corrosion is initiated, Beyond some level, it cracks, cracking and spalling is happening. So within the uh, shorter time, time duration, the corrosion initiates and accordingly it propagates in a faster manner and leading to uh, a early premature distress. In the case of galvanized rebar, the corrosion initiation, it will take longer time for the corrosion initiation. So when the chloride at this level, then only the corrosion initiation happens. That means the period for corrosion initiation is at least more than two to four times as compared to the conventional rebar. So after that only slowly starts corroding. Here also zinc only corrodes and protect the steel. Finally, so it will offer a very good de de design life without, much, without repairs. So nutshell we have to understand from this diagram is galvanized rebars exhibit two to four times higher chloride threshold than the regular rebars. Another important uh, advantage when you go for a galvanized rebar is, as it, earlier I have told, the pH of the concrete is 12 to 13, where due to the carbonation, due to the carbon dioxide penetration, there will be a reduction in pH in the concrete. Once the pH of the concrete comes to 9, then the steel rebar will not give protection or the concrete will not give protection to the steel, steel will start corroding. This will happen in the uncoated conventional rebar. But scientifically, it is proven that in the galvanized rebar, until the pH of 6, it won't allow the steel rebar to corrode. This is a very, very good region. So galvanized rebar, they have scientifically proved that in the pH of the concrete ranging from 6 to 13, the corrosion rate is very, very less. So even the carbonation happens in the concrete. So until the pH reduces 6, that will happen in a very, very rare manner. So this is an another advantage of galvanized rebars. So good tolerable pH range in the carbonation and two to four times more chloride resistance than the conventional rebar. So this picture clearly shows uh, in the galvanized rebars, you can see that passive layer is forming. After that, so this, this passive layer destruction itself will take longer time. After that, zinc only corrodes and steel will not corrode. Once all the zinc is consumed, then only steel starts corroding. So it will take a very longer time for the corrosion initiation in steel. So, so based on the expected environmental conditions, we can design the thickness of the coating. Accordingly, we can achieve the desired service life, uh, a trouble-free service life. Uh, this is again uh, the same uh, uh, same concept in the uncoated rebar. Once corrosion initiates, then propagation is fast. In the in the galvanized rebars, corrosion initiation will take long time. Even after the corrosion initiation, zinc only corrodes. So the up to here, it is a protection stage. Zinc corrodes and protect the steel. From here only real steel corrosion is happening. So you can imagine that from here to here, there is an, so much of uh, horizontal length is there. 
that will give the trouble free service life. Uh, performance evaluation test, uh, uh, I think we have conducted in our lab various performance evaluation tests for this uh, particular galvanized rebars. We have conducted chemical resistance test, uh, applied voltage test, open circuit potential test, macro cell corrosion test. And with respect, as a civil engineer, we are more worried, worried about the uh, bond strength through concrete, at, uh, con concrete uh, how it behaves, an impact and adhesion uh, resistance. So I'll share you some of the, quickly share you some of the uh, test results. The chemical resistant test, the galvanized rebars were placed inside the three mediums, distilled water, calcium chloride, and saturated calcium hydroxide. Uh, saturated calcium hydroxide is a, a typical concrete environment, chloride. So all these three mediums uh, kept for 45 days and we observe, we look for any, whether there is any formation of blistering, loss of bond, and development of corrosion products. So this is the picture showing, even after 40 days immersion in distilled water, uh, there is no corrosion of, uh, corrosion of steel. Here we can see that in uncoated bars, there is a severe uh, corrosion. The case of chloride medium only, no visible corrosion of steel. Whereas in the uncoated, severely corroded. Even in the uh, vapor phase and liquid phase, severe corrosion was observed. The saturated calcium hydroxide, so again, uh, no issues. That means the even in the saturated calcium hydroxide is alkaline medium. So even in the alkaline medium, it, uh, it offers good protection. Uh, this is an applied voltage test. So we used a uh, acrylic sheet container uh, filled with 7% sodium chloride. We used the coated rebars, galvanized rebars, uh, two rebars, and it is connected to the power supply uh, system. And a two voltage was impressed between anode and cathode. Actually, if we uh, keep a potential difference of two voltage between anode to cathode, so the according to the electrochemistry, the chlorides in the solution is moved towards the anodic side where the galvanized or any coated rebar is there, try to penetrate and accordingly damage the coating. This is a very, very severe test. The acceleration factor is more than 2000. So here we are looking for corrosion products at the end of the test period. Uh, even in this test, uh, since it is a sacrificial coating, from the initiation of the test, there was a severe dissolution of say, zinc uh, for one hour. At the end of the test, we did not find any corrosion product of iron. That shows that it sacrifices in protecting the steel rebar. Uh, another important test uh, may, might be interested to the BTEC civil engineering students, open circuit potential test. So in the, in the existing structures, we can assess the uh, corrosion quality of the uh, corrosion rate of the rebar qualitatively by using this uh, half cell potential technique. So in this test, we can take a lead from the rebar and using a standard uh, electrodes, we can measure the potential uh, based on the uh, potential development. We can say that whether the, the rebar inside the concrete is under severe corrosion condition or not. So we conducted this test in our laboratory. So we make a specimens of size like this. We maintain the cover distance of, we vary it from 25 to 50 mm. And we, uh, we, we see to it, this is immersed in chloride solution for 10 days and 10 days uh, drying conditions so that to accelerate the corrosion conditions. We monitored the performance of the bar for uh, one year. So according to the ASTM, if you use different uh, uh, electrodes, accordingly, the differently we have to interpret. Suppose if you use saturated calamine electrode, if you are getting a potential value between 125 to 275, it refers to intermediate corrosion risk. If you get more than 275, it, it refers to 90%. If you are getting more than 400, 425, then severe corrosion. So we monitored the behavior for uh, one year. So here the blue color curve shows the uh, 
performance of the galvanized rebar one year. So here we have to understand that the basic nascent potential of the zinc is minus 1100. So what happened in the one year duration is the zinc uh, st start consuming, but at the end of the one year also, there is a, a reserve zinc is available. That means the steel corrosion not started even after severe uh, exposure to the chloride conditions, bitting and drying, the galvanized uh, galvanized rebar, the zinc consumes and protect the steel rebar. This is again one more test, macrocell corrosion test as per ASTM. Uh, here uh, we have to make a, a prism specimen, the coated rebar, and the chloride solution is voluntarily uh, allowed to enter the concrete so that the top rebar will get corroded. Once this top rebar is corroded, then automatically a couple will happen between top rebar and bottom rebar. And there is a current development between top rebar and bottom rebar that we call it as corrosion current that is measured through a voltmeter. Uh, this test is uh, conducted as per ASTM G109. Uh, these are the uh, values uh, or behavior in this test uh, at the end of one year. Here we can see that galvanized rebars uh, corrosion rate is very less as compared to the uncoated rebar. Uncoated rebar, there is a, a large amount of current development. It indirectly shows that heavy corrosion activity is going on. In the galvanized rebars, we find minimal corrosion activity. This corrosion activity is also a zinc corrosion activity, not the steel corrosion activity. So bond strength as a civil engineer, bond strength is very, very important. Unfortunately, uh, these are the photos taken from the site. The rebars under heavily corroded conditions. By minimal cleaning, we are pouring concrete. Uh, so uh, I used to compare always the RCC with a, a human body, a skeleton uh, uh, covered with mu muscles. Like that steel, uh, concrete encompassing a steel. So the development of a good bond between steel and concrete is essential for the durable, trouble-free service life of the structures. Unfortunately, most of the ongoing project, a minimal care is given to this aspect. Uh, we have to understand what are the things contribute bond strength between steel and concrete. First one is chemi chemical adhesion. So that is the addition of the cement hydrates to the steel that will offer bond strength. Another, the frictional resistance. When we pull the rebar from the concrete, so the concrete has to uh, move against the rebar, the friction. That is, that is also one component of the bond strength. Another one is mechanical interlocking. Uh, now we are using uh, ribbed rebar. So in between the rib, the concrete will be there. When the rod is pulled up, this rib portion will give some resistance. So these are the three contributory factors for the bond strength development between steel and concrete. So in the galvanized rebars, all these things are available or existing in a good manner. This nicely adhered to the surface of the steel, surface of the, actually that uh, adherence from the concrete to the galvanized rebar is very good. Frictional resistance, yes. Then mechanical underlocking, since it is similar to the uh, conventional rebar, no issues in the mechanical interlocking. There is no closing of space between the annular space between one rib to another rib because of coating and other things. In the case of barrier type coatings like fusion bonded and CPCC, there is a possibility that uh, these three mechanisms which contributes to, to the bond strength may get disturbed. So this picture shows you how the, when the rebar is pulled out from the concrete, how the, how the uh, failure mechanism happens when you use metallic coating and non-metallic coating. Most of the time, the metallic coating, uh, since from the rebar to concrete, uh, the cracks will initiate. In the case of barrier coating, from the coating only, concrete breaks. That means, even after pull-out test, 
the coating the coating is not disturbed uh, that indirectly shows that the adhesion is poor so these are the typical bond strength assembly as per indian standards so you have to use uh, the embedded length is only 5 times the diameter of the steel and moreover you have to use helical rings to avoid bursting tensile force and you have to use utm for this so our lab, these are our lab results you can you can see that the brown cover is a brown color curve is the uncoated rebar and galvanization is a green color curve so the brown and green color almost going in a same way it clearly indicates that because of the galvanization process there is no disturbance to the bond strength development between steel and concrete so here we can see that the bond strength at 0.025 mm free and slip is for the uncoated 10.93 mpa galvanization a similar value again 17.76 17.6 so almost here similar bond strength values for galvanized rebar as compared to the uncoated steel rebars uh, the research findings of the kayali and yomans 2000 also reveal the same thing the uncoated rebar and galvanized rebar behave in a very similar fashion uh, for the fusion bonded they found the reduction in the bond strength so it clearly indicates that bond strength at similar slip is, slip, similar slip is similar for conventional and galvanized moreover it offers excellent impact resistance when tested as per ASTM G114 uh, no shattering cracking or bond loss of the coating uh, uh, occurred in the galvanized rebar the, it was very much intact the adhesion test results also showed the similar thing even after 180 degree bending there is no disturbance to the uh, actually no cracking of coating were observed so it clearly indicates that it fulfills the requirements of the codal provisions with respect to impact and adhesion test. Uh, in a curiosity sake, we did some atmospheric exposure test. Uh, galvanized rebars were placed in a residential area eight kilometers from sea and monitored for even 12 years. Uh, this is the picture of the galvanized rebar after one year exposure in the outside. So no visible uh, corrosion of steel, only a minimal corrosion of zinc was observed and uh, this is the same specimen after 12 year exposure even we can see that no visible uh, signs of corrosion of steel so it clearly indicates that it has a very good atmospheric its atmospheric resistance atmospheric condition is a very very good the side conditions even it kept it for few months so no need to worry you can use this and now I will show you some case study. I will take uh, five or ten minutes more. I will wind up. Uh, this is one of the long-term field performance study. Uh, this bridge was constructed. The artisanal fishing pier expansion in Chile. They have constructed this bridge. Uh, the con it was constructed during 2001 and three. Uh, they took three years time to complete. So their design life is only 25 years. So the structure is steel piles, RCC longitudinal and transverse beams, and RCC deck. Uh, here they have used galvanized steel rebars with a thickness of 86 microns. 86 micron galvanized rebar coating, uh, galvanization uh, coating was done, zinc coating was done. So constructed during, completed in the year 2003, uh, 2000, during 2010, this bridges suffer to severe earthquake so uh, actually the bridges distressed and failed when they observe the condition of the galvanized rebar even after seven years of exposure in this severe uh, marine uh, marine atmospheric conditions they did not find any corrosion of steel in rebars only zinc corrosion products they have observed uh, this also a real example of example of a site performance of the galvanized rebars even after seven years after construction 
in a high in a marine conditions it doing good uh, these are the another statistics in the boca chica bridge they have installed they have used galvanized rebar in the year 1972 uh, in the they did some corrosion survey in the years 75 91 and up to 2014 they didn't find any uh, corrosion so again another example of hard dip galvanized employed in 73 still doing good and in the case of other coated rebars they find even up to 35 percent corrosion uh, initiation or corrosion rate so from this uh, research uh, work clearly indicates that if you use galvanized rebars definitely the durability of the RC structure will get improved. So now we come to the first slide. Uh, steel and uh, performance of steel and concrete is equally important for making a durable concrete. The synergistic effect of the concrete and steel is very much important uh, to improve the service life. Once if we if design the structures and fulfill its service life without any repair, it leads to a huge savings of materials, men, manpower, transportation costs, it finally lead to a great, uh, uh, actually the great step towards the sustainability. So uh, this picture again, uh, once more, uh, this is the picture versus time versus damage level. So as uh, civil engineers, we have to design a durable, sustainable concrete and do some a pre prevention strategies to the steel, such a way that the structures, the blue line is extending. The extension of blue line is very, very important. Here only the durability of the building stands. If the blue line is very less, then durability is less. So our measures, our steps shall be focused towards increasing the blue line so that the corrosion initiation is prolonged uh, in the reinforced concrete, once corrosion initiation happen, then the, there will be a rate of damage is enormous. Within the short span of time, it will lead to the repair stage. So all of our, all of our efforts shall be towards the extension of the corrosion initiation. Uh, fortunately, in the galvanized rebars, since it performs well against carbonation and chloride uh, penetration, the blue line is already extended, that's a good sign. So research findings, it, the galvanized rebars offers excellent resistance against chloride, calcium hydroxide, water mediums, and all the test results shows improved corrosion resistance. There is a similar bond strength values and impact and adhesion also good as compared to the other coatings and exemplary performance in the atmospheric exposure. The durability factor, we conducted other tests also, we were able to uh, found that the durability factor or performance factor, even I can say performance factor is two to three times more as compared to the normal state. Now there are some thoughts about this coating. Uh, this is a galvanized rebars are emerging nowadays in India as a promising approach for corrosion prevention. The problem now in the Indian scenario is we are using so much of chemical and mineral admixtures the compatibility of these mineral and chemical admixtures with the galvanized rebars, uh, we have to study in the Indian conditions. In our Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, uh, we have uh, initiated this type of test. So we'll come out with a uh, uh, useful findings in the near future. Uh, moreover, in the current scenario, these galvanized rebars are applicable only in a, a quality conscious a major projects. Uh, in the ground level, more and more residential buildings uh, are becoming a major part in the construction industry. But adoption of galvanized rebar in the uh, residential project, we have to be very we have to be very careful. Since all of us know in the residential project there is no quality control, it's very less. Moreover, we use more water cement ratio. In these conditions, the performance of the galvanized rebar is to be analyzed further. So in these type of cases, we can go for a, a simple anti-corrosion process. So we develop one anti-corrosive polymer solution that can be mixed with cement 
in applied as a coating. This we tested in some residential projects and doing fine. So these are the, actually in all the possible nooks and corners. We cannot wait for the time uh, to uh, adopt the things. In every aspect, every level, we have to do some measures so that durability will be enhanced, lead to sustainability. And with this, I'll wind up. Any questions, I'm happy to answer. Sir, actually, some questions in chat box, sir. Are you noted, sir? OK. Uh, that is uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Babu uh, asking that uh, there will be any reduction in bond strength. Uh, that I have given an answer in the presentation. No mm. reduction in bond strength. Almost, almost you will get a similar uh, bond strength as compared to the conventional rebars. Uh, since it is a meta metallic coating, the thickness is only 50 to 75 microns. So it mm. won't hinder any uh, bond strength, these things. And scientifically, they have proved Many researchers they have reported there is no reduction. And from yeah. Mr. Dhanapal and Radha Krishnan, can we make a threading in galvanized rebar for coupler bars? Uh, if you do threading, definitely galvanized uh, coating will go off. In that case, you have to apply some uh, epoxy coating over the threaded portion alone. Otherwise, the threaded rebars can be fabricated and subjected to galvanized coating to avoid uh, the damage. And uh, one participant requested for sharing the presentation, I will explore. And Mr. Sharad Goyal, this will be economical and safe and less prone to repeated maintenance. It should be recommended everywhere for residential project. Uh, sir, you are very correct. The problem is, the residential, actually, so far the testing done is for your quality control project. Uh, if we go for your residential, all of us know, uh, if the water cement ratio is more uh, points, nowadays even uh, we can see the roadside construction, water cement ratio, easily we can see 0.6 and more than 0.6. This type of uh, uh, situation, it has some uh, uh, reservation to use this. Personally, I have some reservations, more research to be done. Definitely, in the, the quality conscious residential project, definitely we can do. The cost is only initially will be a constraint and people are working on it to reduce the cost. Uh, in general, such recommendations are not frequent in the industry. I do really agree, sir. It is part of the mistake from the academician sites also. So we have to make create awareness and slowly that awareness is coming. Uh, even now, the Bureau of Indian Standards, they are coming out with some uh, code. Uh, actually, it's a unique code is there in the in Indian standards for the hard drip galvanizing. Uh, the cost only is the factor now. Uh, now uh, I think in, at present, it, it will be 15,000 to 20,000. 15,000 at least, we can have a, a cost per metric ton. If they, if they use a mass... Uh, volume, the cost may get reduced. Even if it is reduced to 5,000 to 7,500, then I hope uh, everybody can use. And yeah, thanks for this. Uh, any other? Uh, okay. Sati, one more participant, so Mr. Neeraj Chandrasekhar. Yeah. Uh, uh, can we use the rusticide coating surface for concrete pour, which can be done within two months? Uh, uh, can the use of rusticide coating suffice for concrete pour, which can be done within two months? You cannot. Uh, a coating, the rusticide coating to the steel, sir, you are asking about? Uh, the same person asked for a final question, sir. Is a lapping of the rebus uh, won't be an any issue? Uh, lapping, uh, lapping. Not an issue uh, like a normal rebar we can use. So normal rebar, since bond strength is not affected, the lap length and all taken care of. As yeah. is asked a very wonderful question. If there is reduction in bond strength, then we have to worry about lap length. So here there is no reduction in bond bond strength. The lap issues and design issues will not come. Sir, the another person, uh, Mr. Tirupati sir, asked one more question. If you use recycled materials, will it have the same strength with galvanized? Actually, concrete chemistry, 
uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, if we uh, design a unique concrete, even green concrete or sustainable concrete, always we have to uh, check first during the manufacturing of that durable concrete itself, we have to check the compatibility. We cannot mix anything with anything. So all the compatibility tests we have to do and we have to scientifically prove that the concrete is working fine, then it will not be an issue. Again, uh, it's a very good question. We have to be conduct some compatibility test. Since if you involve more chemical admixtures, more mineral admixtures, then it's compatibility with the zinc coating, we have to conduct with minimum test. Now IIT Madras is working on uh, to uh, come out with a simple test in this regard. Uh, good question. Uh, any other questions, participants? Uh, suppose even if you have any questions, you can uh, post it in the chat box. I will send it to our respected professor. I will get back. Uh, you can answers. mail me in this mail ID. If you have any queries, I'm happy to answer. Anyway, thank you very much for the thank question. You. Uh, Ibrahim. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your valuable presentation. Uh, so shall we move on to what of things? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, now, now I okay. Uh, I will call Dr. G. Soma Sanmugu Sundaram, Honorable Secretary, Kanjipuram Local Center, to deliver his word of thanks. Uh, good afternoon, all present here. A uh, uh, voice. Sanmu sir, your voice is not audible. Sir, your voice is breaking, sir. Sanmu sir, your voice is not audible. Hello? Sanmu Sundar. Okay. Uh, Ibrahim. Sir. Can you uh, can you take up a session? What are thanks session? Yes, sir. Hmm. I think he left. Okay, sir. Hello. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You proceed. Uh, good afternoon all. It gives me an immense pleasure in giving the vote of thanks for this webinar on application of sustainable concrete in modern constructions. So I would like to thank Dr. Elongo, sir, Chairman Kanjipuram Local Center for giving this opportunity for, uh, for uh, uh, collaborating with us. And I thank Dr. H. O. Thakre, sir, the President of Institution of Engineers for giving the presidential address in his valuable time. I thank the panelist members, Dr. M.S. Haji Sheikh Mohammed, sir. No problem, sir. I'm audible, sir. I think I'm... Proceed, ma'am. Proceed. I thank the panelist, uh, panelist members, Dr. M.S. Haji Sheikh Mohammed, sir, Dean, Academic Affairs, for his valuable presentation. And I thank Dr. A. Lima Rose, ma'am, Associate Professor, Valima Engineering College, for her valuable presentation and also i thank dr g shanmugam sundram sir honorary secretary kanjipuram local center i thank all the dignitaries faculty members and students for attending the webinar and making making this event a grand success thank you all thank you ma'am so uh, personally i thank our uh, honorable respected president sir dr uh, thakre for giving a nice opportunity sir thank you sir thank you very much sir thank you sir Okay. Thank you very much. I think you are audible, sir. No? Yes, no. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, sir. Now so we can. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, from uh, Crescent Institute, I like to uh, thank Institution of Engineers uh, for giving us this opportunity to host this webinar. And uh, we are looking forward to more such events in the future. We shall extend all our cooperation in conducting similar webinars in the future. 
thank you thank you ma'am dr ms haji sheikh mohammed and dr lima rose for your wonderful presentation and uh, thank you dr elenko for this opportunity thank you ma'am thank you now we can leave now we can leave